Thank you. So uh, thank you all so much for coming out today. I really appreciate coming to hear our talks. Uh, thank you also to the uh, NHMU for inviting me to speak. It's been a really great weekend, my first visit to the museum. Uh, as uh, Randy mentioned, I am a graduate student at the University of Washington, where I work with doctors Greg Wilson and Carolyn Stromberg, studying plants across the Cretaceous Paleogene, or KPG, mass extinction. And I'm going to talk about some of that work today. Of course, the KPG mass extinction is the focus of this entire weekend. We've been here to some of the other talks. You've heard about plants, uh, dinosaurs, mammals, all kinds of vertebrate and invertebrate groups uh, that were all affected by this mass extinction. And there's a huge focus, I would say. All of us are fascinated by this event, uh, and with good reason. It marks one of the biggest events in Earth's history, and particularly in light of modern rates of extinction and biodiversity crises, we are really interested in knowing more about how ecosystems respond to these kinds of diversity crises. We, all of us uh, in this room, of course, represent the descendants of that mass extinction. Uh, and so it, it also provides a light in which to view the development of the modern ecosystems around us today. Often, when we are depicting or thinking about the uh, Cretaceous Paleogene KPG, formerly known as the KT mass extinction, we often think about the charismatic vertebrates. So we think about the dinosaurs, maybe, or perhaps the mammals uh, who <laughs> rose to such dominance afterwards and, and during. Um, and sometimes we lose sight of the other players on the, the stage. Uh, of course, I am talking about the plants, what I study. And I would argue that understanding the role of plants uh, across a mass extinction like the KPG is vital, not just because plants represent one of the major groups of organisms on life uh, on the land today, but also because uh, plants are the basis of ecosystems. They're the base of the food web. And so you can think if there's some sort of mass die off of vegetation, that's going to have a really profound impact on all of the organisms above them in, in the food web. Uh, and so if we want to have a whole ecosystem understanding of mass extinctions, we need to start with the plants. And uh, folks have also pointed out that, interestingly, plants and, and animals tend to go extinct in, in perhaps different ways, or their survivorship across mass extinctions uh, varies. Um, Green and others proposed this as a sort of two end members. I'll explain these diagrams here. There's uh, the, I would say, the typical vertebrate scenario, the, the chop scenario, where uh, entire clades off of a phylogenetic tree, maybe whole families go extinct, perhaps the dinosaurs, uh, some of the dinosaurs at least. Um, and then on the other side of the spectrum, there's the trim scenario of how mass extinctions might affect a group of organisms. And this is typical, I would say, more of plants. Uh, we maybe can't name any major families of plants off the top of our head that went extinct at the KPG. Uh, and maybe that's because there were many, many species across many families that went extinct. So the overall rate of extinction could still be really high, but it just isn't as the, the type of survivorship that you see across the mass extinction looks different. To display this in another way that might be more familiar, uh, we can think about the KPG boundary and the animals and the plants that were around during that time. Think about the, the dinosaurs, big groups of dinosaurs that wholesale went extinct. Um, and again, among plants, what we tend to see when we're looking at the, the plant mass extinction record is that, again, it was many, many species across a variety of groups. Um, but again, the overall rate of extinction in plants is actually pretty high. Uh, and this one theory is that this might have to do with which particular environments these organisms were growing in. Perhaps uh, the vertebrates had niches that they were particularly uh, living in. Um, versus plants within one family were adapted to a variety of different habits, uh, and this might have given them some sort of advantage uh, within their family. So this kind of survivorship pattern becomes really important when we're studying mass extinctions, understanding who survived and who won in these extinctions. So when I'm thinking about uh, this mass extinction or mass extinction in, gener in general, uh, I think about two big factors uh, that I'll talk about. So first is I think about changes in diversity through time. So this is a theoretical curve of species diversity. This could be the number of species or the richness, so some sort of metric of species diversity through time. Hypo hypothetically, we expect that to drop right before the, the KPG boundary in this case, right before the mass extinction. Uh, and besides rate of extinction or changes in diversity, we're also again interested in survivorship. So changes in composition of plants across this boundary, uh, perhaps some uh, species went extinct, but also just the changes in abundance, which uh, plants became more abundant after and which maybe declined in abundance uh, across this boundary. So these are two points that I'll come back to later on. Uh, diversity changes, rate of extinction, 
uh, as well as survivorship who went extinct, and they kind of guide my research. And so when I started looking around the world, thinking about where I wanted to investigate these questions of plant survivorship and plant extinction across the KPG, um, this diagram is maybe a little bit outdated these days, but it gives you a sense for those black dots show all of the sections in the world where plants have been studied across the KPG boundary. And as folks have really focused on this weekend, there is a huge concentration of work in North America. Uh, and I am contributing to that too. Of course, we would love to have sections outside of that region, but there are a lot of good reasons why we focus so much on North America. And one of those regions is the age of rocks from this area. So this colorful map of the United States shows you the age of different rocks across uh, the land surface. And you can see there's this concentration of rocks in the center of the US, which are these sort of brown, green hues, about 66 million years old or so, which is just the exact age we're interested in and makes this a great spot to go if you want to study KPG plants and animals. And so if we zoom in on the western interior of the United States, there are a variety of sedimentary basins that are from the Cretaceous Paleogene time period, which have been studied for vertebrates as well as for plants. And I'll touch on a couple of those, uh, starting with the Raton and San Juan basins in New Mexico. Uh, I think Tom Williamson will be talking about this shortly later on, some of his work there. Uh, there's also the Denver Basin in Colorado, and Ty Wilson spoke briefly about this, and as, as did Ian Miller yesterday. Uh, and then north of that, there's the Williston Basin in North Dakota. And Tyler was just talking uh, extensively about the record in the Williston Basin in North Dakota. So these are, I would say, some of the best places where we have plants across the KPG boundary. Uh, and while there's been some really great work and great understanding of what was happening to plants, we're still left with several unanswered questions, I would say. Uh, we don't necessarily know the exact rate of extinction among plants. Uh, we have really one record among these that goes from the Cretaceous through the Paleogene in a time series that we can look at rates of extinction. Uh, we don't necessarily know the impact of changes in vegetation on animals. We're starting to get at those questions, but we're still kind of in the early phases of linking all these records together. Uh, and finally, this is just a pretty small sample size, and so we don't necessarily know how these local patterns that we're picking up on extrapolate to more regional patterns of uh, diversity change. And with all of this in mind, I have focused my efforts just across the border from uh, the North Dakota section we were just talking about in the last talk, and I have focused my research on the Hell Creek area in Montana. And this is a great section to study plants uh, across the KPG boundary because it has, first of all, a section, an iridium anomaly. We can look and put our finger on the KPG boundary. Uh, it also has macroflora preserved. And I talk about macroflora uh, as in the fossils, the plant fossils you can see with your eyes to distinguish from the work of Antoine Bercovici and others um, looking at pollen, uh, the microscopic plant fossils. And I would just note that Macroflora are a really great record to look at if you're interested in local scale changes because they represent the trees or plants that were growing right around perhaps the pond or whatever deposit you're looking at versus pollen can travel in from a really wide area. And so I'm particularly focused on macroflora so I can get a really local view of what uh, was changing through time. And then finally, as I alluded to uh, a little bit earlier, there are numerous vertebrate fossils from the Hell Creek area in Montana that have been studied uh, and give me a good record to compare mine to. And just to emphasize that, I'm pulling up two plots of uh, one of mammals, one of various amphibian groups uh, across the Cretaceous and into the Paleocene in this area in Montana. And on the y-axis there is number of species, so richness or diversity through time. And the big takeaway message here is that both of these groups show a big decline right at the KPG boundary. So we've seen that there is overall a mass extinction in these groups in the local record. Uh, and we can look at the particular um, shape of that curve, the rate of extinction, the timing of extinction, and compare that with my plant fossils to see if the two are correlated and if there are similar changes. So of course, the first step to this project is to go out and collect fossils. So as a graduate student, that's what I started about four years ago, going out into the field every summer to go and collect plant fossils from this area. Starts with a lot of pickaxing, shovel work, to get out blocks, split them open, try and look for plant fossils. Those ultimately get wrapped up, packaged in bags and boxes, brought back uh, finally to the University of Washington, where I work to curate, identify, and catalog those specimens uh, and they ultimately end up at the Burke Museum of Natural History, which is on UW's campus. 
Before I go into my data specifically, I wanted to briefly touch and make sure we're all familiar with the types of plants I'm talking about. So this goes back to the title of my talk. I mentioned ferns, sycamores, and palms, which are all big players in the study area that I work in. Ferns, first of all, we are probably all familiar with. They are abundant throughout the section. Here's an example of a fern fossil from my study area. Uh, and the other two, sycamores and palms, are both examples of what are called angiosperms, or flowering plants. And these were incredibly dominant on the landscape at the KPG boundary. About 90% of the fossils we collect are angiosperms. And they are incredibly dominant today. Most of the plants you see around you are probably angiosperms. These include the dicot angiosperms, such as are shown up here, which also includes the sycamore family, um, which were incredibly common throughout and really uh, grew in dominance after the boundary. And that also includes monocot angiosperms, such as palms. So you can see a palm frond, maybe you got to squint to see it, but there's one on the rock there. And then the last major group of land plants that I will mention are gymnosperms. And they are a group that includes many, many, many different groups within it, um, including conifers and ginkgos, uh, which are the two major components that I'll be talking about. So these are many of the plants that I tend to find in the rocks that I look at. And uh, after going out and collecting fossils, I have amassed a, a sampling of fossils spanning about a two million year interval around the KPG boundary. And uh, the blue and yellow dots up there represent distinct sites where I've gone out and collected plant fossils, all from within about a single county in Montana. The Hell Creek Formation on the left is Cretaceous in age. The Tulloch or Fort Union Formation is Paleogene in age. And the boundary between the two, at least in Montana, is about uh, synonymous with the KPG boundary. And you can see time in millions of years along the bottom, just to give you a scale. And I want to focus in on two of these localities for my talk today to show you uh, a good image of what kinds of changes we see across the KPG boundary here. So seafood salad, which is the red square, is a Cretaceous site, uh, preserves plants from about a million years before the KPG, and I would say represents a pre-disaster flora. New York, the green square, uh, is a paleogene site, preserves plants less than 100,000 years after, and gives us a sense for what kinds of devastation occurred at this time. And uh, I know folks are probably wondering how these sites get their name. They are named after by whoever found them. So seafood salad is a, is a funny name that we assign to that one. Um, and it's so named because we find plants as well as numerous invertebrates, um, little shells, uh, material at that site. It's kind of unusual to find both in the same layer, so it got named seafood salad. Here are some pictures to give you a sense for what these sites look like when I'm on the ground. Here, uh, we're doing field work, collecting the fossils. That image on the right from New York is, I think, my hottest field day I've ever experienced. I want to say it was about 105 or 110 degrees underneath the shade tarp that day. Uh, so a lot of work goes into collecting fossils from these sites. And uh, again, I want to use these two sites to show you some examples of the kinds of changes in diversity and changes in plant composition or survivorship that we're noticing across the boundary. So I'll start off by talking about changes in diversity that we see. And I'll do that by showing you a couple of statistics just to simplify these localities a little bit. I'll talk about the number of plant fossils, uh, as well as the number of species that we find at each site. And then because possible uh, differences in species richness or number might be due to differences in sample size, I'll also show you a statistic called rarefied richness, which is basically a statistical method where we pretend that in this case we only sampled 195 specimens at both sites, and it gives us a conservative estimate to account for differences in sample size and still evaluate how uh, diversity changed through time. So starting with seafood salad, the Cretaceous site uh, had a very large, uh, well-preserved collection of fossils, found over at least 35 different species from that site. Compared to New York, uh, the Paleogene site, where we found a much smaller sample size, and also many fewer specimens preserved as well, uh, only 15. And when we calculate that rarefied richness metric, uh, we can see that, uh, again, seafood salad is still much more diverse, much more rich than the New York locality. Um, and again, this is a conservative estimate of species number. So this gives us some indication that there probably was a change in diversity. We would expect that, based on the other records we have from the Western Interior, we can start to get some estimates of the magnitude of that change in diversity. But I mentioned before, I'm interested also in survivorship and patterns of survivorship. So uh, which plants were around at both of these sites? Here are some examples of the fossils that I found at the seafood salad locality, the Cretaceous site. Um, at both sites, we largely recovered vegetative structures, things like leaves that are shown up here, 
Um, but we also found about 9% reproductive structures, things like seeds and cones, some examples uh, to illustrate my point. And now I'm going to simplify all of this into lumping these species into three groups that I mentioned before. So I'll talk about ferns, I'll talk about flowering plants or angiosperms, and then I'll group together the gymnosperms into one group just to give you a sense for the uh, composition of plants at both of these sites. So the Cretaceous site is on the right and the Paleogene site is, sorry, Cretaceous site's on the left, Paleogene site's on the right now. Um, overall, again, there's a big difference in the number of species preserved at these two sites. And if we look at the seafood salad locality on the left there, uh, many more species preserving angiosperms, gymnosperms, and ferns. Uh, whereas at the New York locality on the right, uh, many fewer species and also preserve only angiosperms and gymnosperms. And in fact, all those gymnosperms happen to be conifers. Um, so I'm still investigating whether this is some sort of potential ecological difference, differences in the number of swamp taxa, um, a change from in deciduous versus evergreen breakdown. Still looking into that data a little bit more. Um, but now I'm going to show you the species that are common between those two sites in these lighter colors. So uh, only a small subset of the species present at these two sites are actually shared between the two. Actually, only six species are in common between these two sites. Most of those species, five out of the six, are conifers. So all of the conifers that I recovered from this Paleogene site in New York uh, were also present at the Cretaceous site, which is sort of interesting. Uh, and we tend to find that the conifer species in this region were extremely widespread across the, the region uh, and also very long lived through time, which we can see here. They, they were around for a very long time. Uh, so again, six species in common, so a pretty low fraction of the total species that we've recovered from these sites actually uh, are common between the two. So that starts to give us an indication again that not only was there a drop in diversity or change in diversity at least, um, but there also seems to be some sort of change in plant composition through time. Different plants were growing on the landscape from the Cretaceous into the Paleogene. And so uh, bringing this back to sort of the larger picture of my work, uh, we have currently only looked at just two sites and we're sort of lumping them into conclusions about the entire formation. Uh, however, I do have all those other sites that I showed up there. And hopefully by incorporating all of these sites, I have over 5,000 plant fossils as part of this study, uh, it'll give us a better regional picture of plants and vegetation through time. Perhaps we can elucidate the, the rate of change, the, the shape of that curve a little bit better, and especially look at that recovery interval a little bit more in depth as well. And ultimately, I'm interested in incorporating this back into an ecosystem-wide study. So that includes comparison with the mammals that were present on the landscape to see if the uh, rate and magnitude of plant diversity change matches up with what we see in mammals. And also, <coughs> uh, another branch of future work is to look at these leaves. Uh, by looking at some of the shape and size factors of the leaves, I can say something about climate at the time, temperature and precipitation in particular. And this would give me an indication of whether climate was changing, at least regionally, locally, during this time period, and perhaps whether climate could have, to add another horse in the race, could have been a potential driver of the mass extinction, uh, or the local extinctions at least. Um, so trying to, again, get at that question of cause of mass extinction that Tyler talked about earlier. Uh, and finally, just to bring it all home, my hope as part of this study is to better understand the shift that we see from this reptile-dominated, dinosaur-dominated ecosystems to a mammal-dominated world that we have around us today and see the establishment of modern ecosystems. And that starts with an understanding of the plants at the base of those ecosystems to paint a better picture of what this past world looked like, hopefully so that we can uh, get some insight into what our future world might look like. And with that, uh, I'd like to thank all of the various field and lab assistants, funding agencies, landowners, BLM, uh, Charles M. Russell Wildlife Refuge, all the folks who have given me access to these fossils, and I am happy to take any questions you may have. Oh, in terms of the dating? Yeah, so um, most of those dates come from, uh, you can go back so you can see at least the timeline up there. 
Um, those are just three of the dates that we have. We have many, many more um, dates and, and known marker beds in there. Most of those come from uh, radioisotopic dating techniques that we use um, getting from different ash layers. I haven't shown the uncertainty on here, um, but I will say for the, the sort of rates or the, the difference in, in stratigraphic distance between these sites, um, our uncertainty is actually getting pretty, pretty good. Um, Tyler was talking about this earlier in his talk. Uh, as our dating techniques are getting better and better and better, I think we're more able to say exactly the, the rate of change through time. So um, we're getting pretty precise ages at this point. Ah, yes. Okay. So this can be a little bit of a confusing concept, but essentially if I have those 618 specimens that I collected from seafood salad, and let's say I convert all of them into like little, little tokens, um, one each specimen, and I have the species that it was labeled, and I throw them all into a bag, and I say, okay, I'm going to shake up that bag and just pull out 195 tokens and just count how many species I get. And then I do that same process over and over and over again as a statistical way to estimate if I had only sampled 195 specimens at seafood salad, how many species would I probably have found? Um, and that helps to accommodate that because going from 195 specimens at one site to 618 specimens at another site easily could, could double the number of species that I'm recovering there depending on exactly how many and, and their abundance structure. So does that make sense? Okay. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So the question was about how we accommodate uh, or, or compensate for changes in depositional environment and that kind of thing. Uh, it's a definitely a tricky question. Um, and I would say the first method is by trying to be as standardized as possible in our collecting. So I'm working hard to uh, try and get samples that are from similar depositional environments as much as I can so that I can eliminate that. However, knowing that um, I have a limited sample size. Some of these sites are from channels. Some of them are from floodplains. And as Tyler was talking about earlier, that, that definitely has a difference, uh, we've, we think at least, on what types of animals and plants are preserved at those sites. And so then it becomes a, a question of looking at this data set with some different statistical tools to see if the driving cause of the changes I'm seeing is lithology, is this depositional environment, or whether it is truly a change through time. Um, so there are a couple of ways of sort of teasing that apart, starting with the, the data collection and then uh, also with how we analyze our data sets too. Yeah. Yes. Uh, one question. Just wait one second. At one of the talks yesterday, um, it was mentioned that right after the KPP boundaries, there was an increase in the number of ferns. Mm -hmm. You didn't see any ferns. So I was wondering <laughs> uh, what the difference is. Yeah. So that's a really great point. Um, this fern spike has been really well established, and I was talked about, I think, by a couple of folks, uh, Antoine Bercovici and Ian Miller in particular. Um, I think part of that has to do with the types of record that we're looking at. So the fern spike that they were talking about is often shown best in pollen samples. Uh, and part of that is because of the high resolution we're able to get in time series from pollen samples. So um, if we think about the succession of an ecosystem, ecological timescales, like the Mount St. Helens eruption, for instance, is often touted as sort of an example of this. Um, you know, the, the landscape gets wiped out, and within a couple of generations, within, you know, 100 years, 200 years, you're going to get ferns, you're going to get more plants. Um, from the KPG boundary to my first site that I show up there, the New York locality, I can tell you it's less than 100,000 years. I definitely can't tell you it's 100 years after. And so we might just be missing out on that fern spike because it's a little bit more distant. And I think part of it also has to do um, with that question of depositional environment too, perhaps. Uh, just the types of rock that I'm sampling for that site and where the ferns might have colonized first. So a couple of different reasons, but yeah, good question. I don't know if we have time for one more. Yeah, that's a great question. Uh, so part of it is um, 
they are found by folks, by other folks. Uh, so I came onto this project just about four years ago. And thankfully for me, there had been work done by other paleobotanists. Uh, not really a systematic study, but folks had gone out, they had started collecting, they would made notes of where they found plants. So I had a little bit of a working reference guide, um, but that only helped me with a couple of sites. I needed to go out and find, this is just a sample of my best collected sites. We have over 50 localities that we found. Um, so some of the sites were found by others. Some of them were found by my colleagues who are vertebrate paleontologists who were just walking around and, and happened to dig into the right hillside. And then some of these were found by myself and my crew. Uh, many of them were found by myself and my crew uh, after many days of prospecting. Um, plant sites are, are, I would say, not to disparage my vertebrate paleontologist colleagues in the room, but they're very hard to find. You can't just walk over and see a bone sticking out of the ground. You gotta dig in. So it's a lot of manual labor, a lot of shoulder muscles you develop, uh, and a lot of digging into rocks and not finding anything. But eventually you, you crack open enough rocks and you find some leaf fossils is my motto. Thank you very much. <laughs>